Hi everyone, welcome back to the Ocean Friendly Garden Maintenance Webinar Series. Today we're going to be talking about irrigation systems maintenance. Um, I am your presenter once again. My name is Llewellyn. I am the lead horticulturalist at Soizers Landscapes. And we are currently the contractor that are maintaining several of these ocean friendly gardens. So we're going to talk about irrigation system basics. Um, an irrigation system check, so just a roundabout way to check the irrigation system. Seasonal water reductions and what those um, and what that even means. Irrigation troubleshooting, very basic troubleshooting, and drip line replacement and repair. Um, a word about irrigation it is so easy to get inundated with technical jargon calculations. I'm gonna try to keep it very basic just so you have a jumping off point and you can just go right into these gardens even if you don't know a lot about irrigation um, and get there. Although I'm assuming most people know a good amount about irrigation. So let's go ahead and get started. So, you know, basics, what is irrigation? Irrigation is water supplied to plants to supplement precipitation. So you know, plants need water in nature. Ideally, they would have a good amount of precipitation that would keep them alive. But obviously, in our urban environments um, in Los Angeles, precipitation is not always going to be enough. Um, this year, we're at an all time precipitation low. We're somewhere about 70% of the precipitation that we normally would receive in February. So, irrigation is definitely something that we are going to have to supply to our plants. And every drop of water needs to be used wisely. Um, you know, ocean-friendly gardens, California native plants, we're all in the vein of um, conserving resources. And so the same needs to be set with water. If we're doing less maintenance to conserve fuel, we also need to be conserving water. So we know that high pressure systems like overhead irrigation are commonly known for wasting huge amounts of water, um, evaporation, runoff, just system situations that lead to water being lost, the wrong kind of irrigation hats are being used, all these kind of things are leading to water loss. Um, and so that is something we need to pay attention to. But in ocean friendly gardens, we're primarily using drip irrigation systems. But the same energy that we put into not losing water or thinking about the loss of water that's from these high pressure systems, we need to put that same energy into low pressure systems. Because even though they are low pressure and they're using less water, we do need to make sure that there are certain things that we're doing so that we're not losing water from these systems as well. So plants use water, obvious. Um, and the system that they lose water in game water is somewhat of a fluid system. They're constantly losing, and therefore they constantly need to be gaining water, or not constantly, but they need to be gaining water at some point. Um, so plants lose water by evaporation. So evaporation is directly the water leaving the soil surface. And so the water that was in that soil was obviously going to be used by the roots. And so that's evaporation. And then transpiration is the water that's going to be lost um, from the stomata. And so transpiration and evaporation are two loss of water. And most of the water that the plant is supplied, about 99% of the water that we give to the plants or they receive through precipitation is lost to transpiration, but that's okay because um, it's an important function that plants need to be able to transpire. Plants gain water, like we mentioned, precipitation, rain, um, and irrigation. And the plant water use is going to depend on the plant type first and foremost. Some plants are inevitably going to need more water, depends on their size, depending on um, where they are native to, depending on all kinds of things. The type of plant is it a turf grass, is it a large tree, is it a small perennial? Um, and then the environment. So is it an urban environment? Is it out in nature, that these things are all going to determine how much water a plant is going to need. And so the combined loss of a plant are called evapotranspiration, um, or we affectionately call ET. And so ET is somewhat, it could be 
put in somewhat of a complex conversation. But the basic premise of ET is that it takes a measurement of the water that is consumed by a reference crop over time. And we call that reference ET. And that is the basis of all irrigation. That is how we know how much water that this plant is gonna need in this particular location during this particular time. So it uses historical data for the climate or the area. And so if we look at this chart, and so our reference crop is going to be a cool season turf grass in California. So tall fescue. Tall fescue is notoriously high. It needs a large amount of water. Um, and that's why it's the reference crop. And so if we look at this chart, we can see in Palm Springs in the month of June, a tall fescue plant is going to need almost 10 inches of water for that month. And then if we look at Riverside, which is more close to, um, you know, our area, it's going to need about six inches of water for the month of June. And so that is kind of how we understand water consumption and water use. And so ET is determined by solar radiation, temperature, humidity, and wind speed. So it takes everything in the climate into effect. And ET is actually what a lot of these smart irrigation systems are using to determine um, how much water that the system is going to need. And so the good part about reference ET is that most plants are not going to need that high amount of water that tall fescue needs. So most plants need somewhere about 20 to 50% of ETO, which means reference ET. And so for the plants that are in the ocean friendly gardens, they're gonna need closer to that 20%. And so that is how we understand plant water use and that is what we compare it to. And that's how we know what to water these particular plants. Um, a word about native plants. And so lots of native plants in the landscapes. Native plants are great, but native plants are going to perform differently in urban environments. And so this coffee berry, which um, is from like the Chaparral region of California, it's gonna perform much different when it is in an urban environment. And so there's lots of things at play. There's um, plants that it's competing with. So in this picture, we have turf grass, we have a large tree, they're all competing in that soil um, for resources. There's maybe excess water from the turf grass. There's a restricted growth. So the roots may not be able to spread as far and wide because there's structures. All these things need to be taken into account. So when we have a plant and we're like, oh, well, it's very drought tolerant, um, that's usually based on its performance in its native environment. And so it's going to perform a little bit differently. So that, with that being said, um, the abandon that native plants can kind of have when they are out in the wild um, is not necessarily something that we can do when they're in our urban environments. Um, so native plants are adapted to cool, wet winters and warm, dry summers. That's, you know, that's what California is or Southern California is. And so here's a chart from 2019 of the average precipitation in Los Angeles. And you can see that it kind of follows that same cool, wet winters, warm, dry summers. Of course, this is going to vary year by year and we're not going to get a lot of water some years and we're going to get way more water some years. But on average, we have wet winters. So January, February, March, December is when we get most of our rain and then the summers are going to be exceptionally dry um, with very little rainfall or no rainfall at all. And so in general, for the native plants, their active growth is going to be in the fall, winter, and spring. Um, what these plants do in the summer is they have this type of dormancy, which is kind of like a survival dormancy where they're escaping, um, growing a lot in the summer because it's so hot. Um, but to, with that being said, this dormancy is something that these plants do for survival and it's not necessarily um, something that may happen in our type of, um, in our environments, in our urban environments. So let's bring back up the criteria for irrigating ocean-friendly garden because 
this is what we're here for this is what we're talking about and it doesn't hurt to be reminded of what the standard is for keeping these gardens in the exact way that they're supposed to be so the criteria straight from the ocean friendly garden surf rider organization handbook hand watering or high efficiency irrigation system um, drip irrigation um, is a half inch diameter or larger and so that basically tells us that there is no spaghetti irrigation so no um, spaghetti drip lines which are very common in the drip line industry um, but those are not allowed in these gardens automatic irrigation controller if present has a rain shut off device and so a rain sensor is basically going to tell the irrigation system it's raining outside a certain amount of inches of rain have fell so therefore you don't need to provide that supplemental irrigation um, the hoses are going to have shut off nozzles and there will be a weather-based or smart irrigation controller um, that is actually being used to its full capacity and the plants are grouped by hydro zones and i talked about hydro zones a while back and we were talking about replacing plant replacement schedules and the thing about hydro zones uh, is that sometimes it's not completely possible so hydro zones are grouping plants with similar water requirements based on the plant type irrigation method soil type and other criteria and they're all going to be on the same valve and so since they're on the same valve they're going to be basically all coming on at the same time and all going off at the same time and so that's to say that um most of the plants in the garden are low water use to moderate water use and so you're gonna have times because the gardens, the ones that we maintain, they usually only have two valves. And so you have two options and the plants are kind of mixed together. So you don't really have a, like a huge space to say, oh, I'm only gonna put moderate use plants in this area and um, low in this area because what's there is already there. Um, and that's not to say they haven't put consideration into hydro zoning because they have, but um, it's not perfect. And so one way to go around this, well, not really go around it, is to use it in intermediate. And so you could use kind of an intermediate watering rate of what would work good for the low and what would work good for the moderate and kind of see how that works out. Or you can water to the low or you can water to the high. It really depends on a lot of other things. And so at each individual garden, you can take into that account and figure out what would make work best for you because there is no right way to go about this especially when you have a mixed plant water usage around your area and so obviously when we're talking about irrigation um, for these gardens we're using drip irrigation so those are known as low pressure irrigation systems because they don't use a whole lot of water pressure to function um, so some of the advantages, they're de designed to reduce inefficiency and water loss. Uh, they deliver water only to where the plant needs it, so right at the roots. There's little to no evaporation, runoff, or overspray, and your water costs are going to be lower. There are some disadvantages, though, and I mentioned the disadvantages because I want these to be something that come into your mind constantly when you're looking at these gardens because these are issues that you will have to address at some point. Um, so insulation and maintenance costs are going to be higher. The tubes can break and the tubes will break. It's a part of it, especially, um, you know, if you're out there and you're, maybe you're cutting back your grasses one day and you didn't see the tube and the tube was cut. And that's something you have to fix. And that's OK, because it happens quite often with drip irrigation, especially when they're in an older planting and you can't really see the lines and they've been buried by mulch. All these kind of things come into play. Um, and they are easily disturbed by animals or people, and so animals can chew the lines, people can trip over the lines and, you know, move them from where they were supposed to be at. So all these kind of things, um, they need to be addressed and they need to be something that you're looking at and paying attention to. Okay, so let's talk about an irrigation system check. And I can't get super specific on technical details because each garden has something different going on for it, controller-wise um, and irrigation-wise, but there are some general things we can talk about. 
So before we get into irrigation talk, even if you don't know a lot about irrigation, irrigation is usually something very specialized that people get into, so don't feel bad if you don't know a whole bunch about it. But here are the parts of an irrigation system um, for a drip system in general. There are going to be some things that are, um, you know, there may be some additional things and there may be less of these things, but these are the basics of what you should have. So if you don't have them, um, consider getting them. Um, so a valve, obviously you need a valve for an irrigation system to work. Um, that's going to control the flow of water. You also are going to need a pressure regulator. And because these are low pressure systems and what a lot of these um, water, the water is good, the water that is supplied is going to be pretty much pressurized at a high rate, especially if it is coming from having subsurface high pressure irrigation like sprinklers. So you need to modify the pressure. So a lot of these systems are low pressure using anywhere from like 25 to 40 PSI. Um, of course, your drip tape, your drip line, um, and there's many different types. If you're using uh, reclaimed water or recycled water, you're gonna have purple drip tape. Barb fittings, couplings, and so basically to put the lines together and to build your drip system, um, you know, kind of like building some Legos or something. And then you're gonna have your inline drip emitters or called button emitters. Sometimes these are the types that the gardens have. There's many different options when it comes to emitters, but these are the types that we have. Um, and then you'll have a filter. So sometimes the filter is put together with a pressure regulator, which many of the gardens have. Um, and so it'll all be in one unit, but inside of the filter, it's basically gonna filter out small particles that may be coming out of the water. And so that's important because the drip lines are so small, you wanna make sure you filter out all the particles. Um, and so it'd be a wide filter. And this is something that you have to locate on your system and figure out where it is because it's important in drip line maintenance. Well, all of these things are. So first day you have, um, you're taking over, you are going to figure out how you want to maintain these gardens. First, you want to, I, what for, I would do first is I would gauge the soil moisture. Just take an overall um, measurement of how much water is actually in the soil. So what I do, I would take a soil probe, much like this one, I would, you know, dig it into the soil and I would take a composite. So I would walk all around the garden. Um, try to reach every area, reach the high points, the low points, and look and see what is the moisture level. What is it? Is it really dry at the high points? Is it dry in the corners? Is it really low at the low points? Is it low? I mean, is it really high next to an irrigation um, valve box? Figure out all these things and see, you know, what's going on. Just an overall general assessment. You can also use an electric water meter, which these are really handy, about $250. Um, it will take the volumetric water content and give you a number. And it will also take the electric conductivity. And so if you're using recycled water, this is a cool tool to have because it will tell you the relative salt content that is in your water or in your soil from the water. So uh, a good tool to have, but you can also just use a very regular soil probe. You can also like, you know, dig up a little bit of the soil. You can use a screwdriver, all kinds of things to figure out um, how much moisture is in the soil. Um, and then if there's a problem, identify the problem. So if it's too wet, too wet soil is a bad thing. Um, the soil is gonna be compacted. Uh, the plants are going to be over water and there's going to be a low oxygen in the soil and so plants need oxygen the roots need oxygen so if there's too much water there's no room for the oxygen um, and the plants are eventually going to suffer for that so signs are limp leaves regular or rangy growth lots of vegetation little flowers a very obvious sign that you could see is just a growth of moss or mold or algae and that tells you okay there's too much water in this area i need to figure out what to do 
And you might notice this, especially if your garden has um, turf grass near it and some of the turf grass irrigation will overshoot on the edges of the garden. So you can figure out that there may be too much water. Um, there's also some weeds that will indicate there's too much moisture. And so these weeds, although some of them may not be in the gardens at all, but if you see a high influx of these weeds or influx of these weeds, then that lets you know that um, you know, these moisture loving weeds are in this area because there's a lot of water. So chickweed, clover, dandelion, oxalis, pennyworth, plantain, dichondra, they will all be in areas where there's a high amount of water. And then if your soil is too dry, which I don't, none of the soil is going to be this dry, but you know, if it's too dry, the plants cannot perform essential functions. So if it's too dry, no photosynthesis, um, no metabolic functions are going to happen, no growth. Um, signs, wilting or drooping plants, brittle leaves, shedding older leaves, stunted new growth, um, burns around leaf edges. Burns around leaf edges can mean many things, um, but water and all the abiotic factors are something you should check first before you determine if it's like a nutrition um, deficiency. Um, and weeds that indicate dry conditions, cheese wheat, crabgrass, lamb's quarter, prickly lettuce, spotted spurge, um, all the thistles, and purslane. So once you figure out what is the soil too dry, is it too wet, now you can start considering your water goal. So your water goal is how much water you want to give to this plant. And your water goal um, is basically a product, I mean, of runtime. And runtime is a product of your water goal. So your water goal, let's just say for these low water use plants, is going to be one inch uh, per month. And your delivery rate is basically how much water each emitter, each individual emitter um, in the system is going to put out. And that lets you know um, how long your run time should be. So how long you should schedule that irrigation timer to run. And so I got these handy dandy charts from the Inland um, Valley Planner and they are a really good um, group of people who work a lot with native plants. And so every plant that is in the gardens currently um, falls into one of these categories that they put together. So low water use plants, toyon, California buckwheat, coffee bear, um, conchesia notas, and agave. These are low water use plants, irrigation schedule one. And you can see that it pretty much lays out how much water they're going to need throughout uh, the whole entire year. So in January to February, they're going to need about a zero to two inches of water. And um, there's an asterisk because it may potentially rain at these times. And so if it rains and you get like two to three inches of rain or one inch of rain even, then you can effectively reduce the irrigation that you provide. And hopefully that's something that your water sensor does for you automatically and you don't need to go and manually put that into your um, controller. So um, one, so you can also see that the irrigation schedule in this chart, it kind of follows the precipitation rates that we had. And so during the summer, you can irrigate one inch. And then um, during the more cold, your irrigation should be zero to two inches. Looking at uh, low water use plants that are scheduled two, and you can see that they need um, zero to two inches of water in the cold months as well. But in the spring, summer, they're going to need one to two inches of water. And so some examples of plants that fall into that category, yarrow, mooly grass, coral aloe, um, all the stages that are present, which are plenty of them. Um, and then we have moderate use plants, so Douglas, Iris, um, Coyote Brush, Marina Strawberry Tree, Red Butt, um, the Western Red Butt. And so they're going to need more water. So during January, March, they're going to need zero to three inches. And then during uh, April, May, April, they're going to need two to three inches, May, one to two inches, all the way up until September and then October, two to three inches. November back to that zero to three inches. And so um, during each irrigation round, you should be providing approximately one inch of water. 
Um, and then that kind of correlates to how many runs you're doing per month. And so if I'm providing one inch um, per run and I need three inches, then I need to do three runs um, throughout the month. And so you could separate them however you see fit. Um, I would wait till the soil dry it out and then apply my other inch and then wait till it dries out again and apply another inch. And so finally, we have moderate used water plants. And so these are going to be the plants that need the highest amount of water in the gardens. And so some examples, sea thrip, um, blue fescue, which is present in small amounts, dune sedge, filled sedge, there's plenty of sedges. And so they're moderate water use plants. And so during June, July, and August, they're going to need three to four inches of water. So you are going to have to do, you know, three to four irrigation events during these months, each individual month. And so now that you have the goals and how much water these plants are generally going to need, um, you have to turn your water and goal into a runtime. And so an easy way to do this, if you um, don't know exactly how much water each emitter is emitting, you can go on the manufacturer website. So when we're talking about overhead irrigation, there's many ways to audit it. You can do the drip can test um, and all these type of things, but that's not really possible with drip irrigation, especially since the drip irrigation has been down for a while and lots of the lines are covered up by mulch. You can't even look and see for wetting patterns or anything like that. So the best bet is to look at the emitters and look at what the manufacturer um, has put out about the emitters. Or if you don't um, know the manufacturer or you don't want to do that, you can use a drip rate calculator, which is easily, you can Google that and um, find, there's several of those that will help you find um, how much water you're putting out. So for example, um, lateral line spacing. So lateral lines are usually spaced um, 18 inches. And so um, then we would consider the type of emitter that we have. And so if we have an emitter that's emitting uh, 0.9 gallons per hour emitter flow, we would, you know, look in this category and then we would look at the emitter spacing. So how separate they are. And on the line, there would be about a foot apart general. These are um, general terms. You can look and see the difference for your individual garden. And so if there are space, if the lines, the lateral lines are spaced 18 inches apart and then uh, the emitters are 12 inches apart, we can see that we'll be putting out 0.96 inches of water per hour. And so you can kind of round up and you can say that it's putting out about one inch per hour. So if my watering goal is to water this plant one inch during the month of June, then I would run my irrigation system for one hour during that month and that would and that would be putting out the amount of water that I am required to put out and so um, once again definitely check the manufacturer uh, the most basic one this is from Rainbird Rainbird is very common for irrigation things but it's going to be slightly different um, if you're using Hunter or, or um, Netafim And so with that runtime, there is something to consider, which is soil type. And so in soil type, we have this thing called infiltration rates. And so we have to consider the soil texture um, when we're talking about watering and infiltration rates. So depending on the percentage of whatever, um, whatever um, soil type we have, so is you know it's not going to be a true sand, and it's maybe not be very clay, maybe somewhere in the middle, maybe a mixture of those, but that does whatever the percentage of whatever um, texture is there, that will change the infiltration rate. So sand, of course, is going to have the quickest infiltration rate, so it's going to be somewhere in the middle, and then clay is going to have a really low infiltration rate, so it's going to take longer for that water to basically go down into the soil. Or you can use this handy dandy chart, um, this USDA soil triangle with infiltration rate shown that show you how long it will take uh, for inches of water to go down into the soil. And you can see that sand um, five inches in one hour, right? 
versus a very high clay, 0 0.01 inches in an hour. So, you know, just huge extremes of how fast this water can go in. And so what you can do instead if, and so this problem is usually addressed when we're talking about overhead irrigation, but it should be considered when we're talking about drip as well. And so what you can do is you can break up your one hour that you need to in several different um, smaller periods so that it has time to infiltrate. And you want to do it all in the same day. So, you know, you run it for 20 minutes and you turn it off for an hour and then you can turn it back on and run it for the rest of the time and then turn it off run it again and so that helps with infiltration and make sure that the water actually gets down into the soil where the plant needs it also hillsides need to be considered and so one of the uh, ocean friendly gardens which is the one in Manhattan Beach the Strand it is very much a hillside. And so that's something you wouldn't consider um, when choosing your rates, you want, um, when choosing your runtime because you want to have more spaced out, broken up run times so that the water can actually infiltrate and not just slide down the hill. And then all the plants at the bottom are gonna end up with um, more water because that's just the way gravity has worked. So definitely something we consider um, even when you have a big mulch layer, you still should consider it because it's a good practice to have this in mind. As far as controller settings go, um, my main thing, schedule irrigation only when it's needed. Irrigation controllers are just very smart computers and they can do exactly what we want them to do. It just takes us to put in all the information. Um, and it saves a lot of the hardship that we could have with irrigation if we pro program our irrigation controller um, successfully. Um, so you can use the interval function to schedule monthly watering. And so a lot of these irrigation timers are meant to be ran on a weekly basis. So usually like three times per week, but that may not be something that you want to do because these gardens require much less water than like a turf grass or a typical landscape. So you could use the interval function. And so basically you could set an interval for like 14 days and then it'll water It'll do whatever you schedule to do every 14 days. So that would be your twice a month irrigation watering. And if you want to know specifically about your controller, all the functions it can do, there's so many YouTube videos on each individual controller that can be found on the manufacturer's website. Um, you want to do seasonal adjust. So seasonal adjust is a very great function. So if your controller is not the newest, highest technology, most smart automatic controllers will have some form of seasonal adjust in order to basically um, take whatever you put into it as your baseline water. And so think about that chart for ET. So if I would have my baseline water for that grass, um, I would put in, you know, whatever, like 10 or whatever, like 10 inches. And then if I was in Palm Springs and then I would adjust it seasonally. So, you know, during the cold season, I would take off 50% of that. Or if I'm having, you know, even warmer season, I would put up like maybe 50%. So seasonal adjust can do that um, once you go into the settings and do it. And it could do anywhere from five to 200% of whatever your baseline is, which is a large range. Um, and if there's a heat wave coming up, this is the, I mean, we've been having crazy, weather unexpected weather so if there is a heat wave and you can look at your um you know your weather app and see a heat wave is coming up you definitely want to increase the water at least 72 hours before the heat wave um, to get that water in the soil so plants are able to use it because they are going to be transpiring a bit more so um, that's something to consider and also use your rain sensor Hook your controller up to Wi-Fi. Um, there's so many situations where controllers are not being used to their full capabilities. Lots of these controllers have apps. You can actually change the settings from your phone, so you don't even have to physically go up there sometimes. Rain sensors, you can see how many inches of rain have hit that sensor, so you can decide 
okay, I'm going to let it turn off or that wasn't enough rain, all kind of things. So using your controller to its full function is super important and it's gonna be helpful in letting you um, irrigate properly. So here's some general irrigation tips. Um, water recommendations, all of the ones that I provided from the Inland Garden um, Valley Planner. Uh, they are for established plants. Generally, new plantings are gonna need about one inch of water per week. So if you ended up uh, replacing a lot of your plants at one time, you are going to have to provide more water for them just until they get established. You wanna do deep, um, infrequent irrigation when soil is a dry to depth, which I'll explain what that means in a second, at three to four inches. Uh, you want to water where the roots are, very obviously, but a plant's root system is um, most active in the zone equivalent to the outermost branches, and so, you know, you have that zone, so it's a shrub, and then you'll have outward branches, and then you can water where those branches are, and that helps um, the plant grow even more roots because there will be water available. And do not water right next to the crown. Um, commonly, you'll see drip emitters right next to the crown of the plant. That's not a good thing because it will be providing maybe too much water to that crown area. And that's, you know, too much water, fungal affections, um, all kinds of diseases. So that's not something you want to do. Um, so what dry to depth means is basically it's going to vary among plants how much they want to be dry to depth. But... Um, you basically see how deep the soil is dry, and that lets you know you should irrigate again. So an example is yarrow. So yarrow's dry to depth is four inches in the spring, six inches in the fall. So basically, I would irrigate my plant, and then I would see how many inches is before the soil gets wet. And so I would use like a soil probe. And if there was four inches of dry soil and then it was wet under that, I would know in spring, okay, I can water again. What this does is it promotes um, deep rooting for the plants and overall it's going to help the plants uh, be more resilient against um, low water drought conditions and stuff like that. And it may seem like a lot of work <laughs> to dry down the soil, but it's very much recommended because of the benefits. And so all of the information of dry to the soil, um, dry to depth, can be found in the California Friendly book that I showed on the first webinar um, that is available online for free. So it's called California Friendly um, Landscape Maintenance Guide. It's a really good book and I would suggest if you're maintaining these plants or you're new to maintaining native plants that you use it. Okay, I'm gonna stop for any questions. I'm not seeing any questions. Sorry, come in. Let me turn that on. <laughs> um, but I did have a question that came up about Wibix while you were presenting that section. And one thing that I was wondering is how often should the staff actually check the system? I know I think you mentioned monthly, but I just wanted to verify with you as far as um, the weather-based irrigation control. I guess one question I had is how many of these ocean-friendly gardens actually have from the actually have weather-based irrigation controllers and then if they do have it how often should they should staff be checking for those items so i have it in my next portion but all of them have smart irrigation controllers for sure um weather base maybe two um the thing about a lot of these gardens that i did mention is that the irrigation may sometimes be shared with other parts of the facility so you don't necessarily have full control over it um, but the ones that you do, like Gardena, for example, that does have a smart controller and it also has a um, rain sensor. Um, the rain sensor is hardwired in, so it's connected, but there may be other cases where there's a rain sensor that needs to be connected via Wi-Fi and it's not actually functioning with the controller. So that is something to consider. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. That was it for the questions. Okay. Okay, so seasonal water reductions. So 
obviously irrigation demands are gonna change throughout the year. Um, rainy season, warm season, pay attention to it. There's so many times where irrigation systems will only be changed twice a year or once a year or not at all. You'll go outside and you'll see a landscape and it'll be irrigated when it's raining outside. These are things we wanna avoid. These are things that we need to be changing. Like, you know, the landscape industry, there's so many practices that are in place because it's just the way things have always been, but it's something we need to consider. We need to be more thoughtful um, with how we irrigate. And I mean, the plants are not gonna need a lot of extra water when it's raining, so why are we irrigating? So definitely consider the irrigation demands, pay attention to the weather always um, to decide, you know, um, do I need to provide this extra water or will the plants be just fine without it? And then of course, utilizing the rain sensor. Um, the rain sensor, you could set it at a certain level. So how much, how many inches of rain or how much rain is gonna be is gonna come down before it actually shut off. And so lots of people I noticed they worry that the rain sensor will turn on and uh, it won't be enough rain and it will pretty much not provide the water that the plants needed. But you can figure that all out. The technology is so advanced now that we can not wholly depend on it, but we can depend on it in a lot of ways to provide um, things for us to be more efficient in our watering. And then, of course, seasonal adjust. So using the seasonal adjust function if you do not have a true smart controller. So smart controllers, they typically use historical data, but if you do not have a true smart controller, you can look at historical data for your area. You can still do seasonal adjust and figure out, um, you know, what percentage of this water do I need to provide during each particular month? And so, Seasonal water demands, huge thing. You can see the difference that they provide throughout the year. So um, the low water use plants are gonna need you know, less water during the summer potentially. Still some, but less. Um, and then the moderate use water plants are gonna need a little bit more water during those really hot months. And so a note, most manzanita and cianotas are really prone to diseases if they're water in the winter. That's because that's hot, wet soil, a prime ground for fungi and bacteria. And so um, this is when you don't wanna be doing a lot of watering, especially if you have a garden which has a lot of these plants. Um, so you don't wanna do that. And so here's a seasonal maintenance calendar. And so basically I've broken up the seasons and these are things you should do going into each season. So in spring, um, turn on the controller. If it was off, adjust the controller. And so, um, you know, keep your watering go in mind for the spring and then use that. You can unscrew the end caps and flush the breeze. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And also clean your filters. In the summer, you also wanna adjust the controller again. And I say adjust the controller, unless you had seasonal adjust on and then it can do the work for you. But if you didn't, you can go in there and physically adjust it. Um, and so also modify, upgrade or fix the system. And so this is a good time, especially if you have a lot of those moderate use plants. And so like, if there's a whole bunch of fill sedge or dune sedge, this is something that you want to make sure that, you know, all of the lines are where they should be at, are the emitters where they should be at, do I need to add more emitters maybe, do I need to add more lines, do I need to change things, are the plants outgrowing the system that's in place. Um, you also want to mulch for sun protection. Drip lines can, you know, they do need protection from the sun, they'll break down, they'll get weak, they'll get brittle. And so you do need to protect them so they last longer. With that being said, if they are brittle and they have been exposed to too much sun and you notice that they are weak and they snap really easily, uh, this is when you can start replacing them. In the fall, you wanna adjust the controllers. Um, again, you wanna bury and protect the lines from rodents. This is when a lot of the rodents are coming up from. Um, breeding time and then you also want to unscrew the end caps and flush the system of debris 
And you also want to clean the filters. So cleaning the filters is an event you should do twice a year. And uh, it's easy to forget to do this, but it does make the system run more effectively. And in winter, you either want to turn off um, if you're getting rain or you want to adjust for minimal needs. You also want to remove and clean, um, replace clogged emitters. And so cleaning them is somewhat of a task, um, but it's possible. Or you could just replace the ones that are not working well. And so here's the filter, a typical um, Y filter that will be in a drip system. Uh, important note that sometimes your filter will be leaking and that's because the o-ring may have fell off so you definitely want to keep that and so the o-ring um, help lock it into place when it's put together and so you pull this filter out and you just rinse it off with water um, don't try to clean it with a blower or anything like that you just rinse it with water to get all the sediment out of there and you put it back into place um, as long as it's functioning and you're not getting a lot of sediment in your line, then you don't need to replace it or anything like that. Um, flushing the system, basically, so at the end of the drip line system, you'll have it either, it'll be folded like this and you'll have like a figure eight um, cap, basically. And you open the valve and then you take off the cap and you let the water run at full volume for two minutes and you make sure the water is clear and that lets you know your system is clean and it will be providing water. And so, you know, these small lines, they can get filled up with sediment or, you know, soil particles or all kinds of stuff. So you definitely want to make sure that you're flushing your system on a regular basis. Clogged emitter. So it will be laborious, I will admit that, but you do want to check your emitters and make sure that they are putting out water. Um, you could just have a season like, you know, every five, six years, just go through and replace all of them. But if you're checking them on a um, yearly basis, you should be fine. And so the clock emitters can be clean. Um, so you could put them in vinegar and clean them off or you could replace them. And so you wanna make sure um, that they have the same flow rate that they are supposed to have. Um, and also check all the fittings. So all of those barbed fittings and couplings, uh, you wanna make sure they're not leaking as well and that they're pressed tightly together. Also, um, once a year, you should be checking the pressure. And so making sure that the pressure is what it's supposed to be. So you can install a pressure gauge at the end of the line um, and check the dynamic pressure. And so what this can do for you is it can also let you know if there's a leak somewhere in the line. Um, and that also tells you a lot of things um, that you may need to fix. And so also, um, you need to have the pressure correct because if the pressure is too high, uh, the system is going to all the tubes are gonna break apart because there's too much pressure in the water. If it's too low, the water is not gonna come out at the rate it's supposed to. So checking the pressure, very important, something you need to do on a yearly basis if you can. Okay, so a little about irrigation troubleshooting. There's so many things that can go wrong with irrigation, but the basics with drip irrigation. So turn on each zone manually and walk around. Um, that's a good way to do it. You can look for saturated soil, but you can also listen for leaks. You can hear a slightly different sound that's going to be happening if there's a leak somewhere. So, you know, you want to do this um, on a seasonal basis if you can. Just walk around, look, see if there's super wet spots, um, see if there's a dry spot, all kind of things. And you can hear a leak a lot of the time, especially if it's a larger leak. Common drip system problems. So drip emitters are clogged. Your remedies, clean the filter um, or install a new filter if you need it, if there's no water coming out of your emitters. Um, flush the system because maybe there's something in the line that's clogging it up or replace emitters. So try all of these things, you know. Um, if there's dry soil or signs of plant stress along the lines, you can look for a leak because maybe there's a leak that's not allowing the water to come down the line. You can double check the valve time. It's easy to accidentally uh, change the settings in the controller or not control, turn the controller on after um, 
setting it up, all kind of things can happen. Um, it happens. Or you can check the emitters and see if those particular emitters in that dry area are working or functioning or putting out water. Um, if you have leaks that are reoccurring a lot in your lateral lines, um, of course, replace the leaks, but then you also want to make sure that your lines are buried with three to four inches of mulch that protects them um, as much as they can be protected from the sun, from people walking on them, from animals, just from them breaking. If there's uneven water distribution, um, so it's really wet in one spot, really dry in the other spot, check the pressure in the line, straighten the path of the drip line. Um, you could run hoses across the slope instead of down the slope if you have a sloping um, garden. You can also remove some watering devices, so maybe there's too many emitters in your line and that will increase the pressure. Um, which is also very common if you're setting up your own line. You want to make sure that you're doing it, you know, at minimal 12 inches apart each emitter. So some common valve problems, the valves will not shut off. So some remedies um, for that, some remedies are to clean or replace the diaphragm. You can replace the bleeder screws or you could check the solenoid. If your valve will not turn all will not turn on. Um, you can loosen the flow control screw. You can run an electrical diagnostic. Um, it may be something with the solenoid, and then you can repair that. Some tips, you want to check the diaphragm and clean the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm. Sediment will collect on the diaphragm. You want to um, take care of that. Um, you want to remove the debris from the valve, so sometimes you can open up the valve, there may be rocks in there or lots of soil, that's something you want to clean and take care of. Um, if your valve is not con um, communicating with your controller, so you turn your system on and the valve is not opening and letting water out, it, the solenoid might need to be replaced. And that's something that, it's not an easy fix, but it's definitely something that you can maneuver um, you know, watch some YouTube videos, ask your irrigation professional and they can do it for you. Okay, so really quick and easy drip line replacement. And so compared to subsurface irrigation, drip lines will need more small repairs more often. And so small repair, you know, easily the drip line has cracked. You can easily, it's a small fix. So what you're gonna do, you pull back the mulch layer, Tools, you may need an insert tool that can insert the uh, fitting into one part of the line, but it's completely up to you. You can also just do it by hand, just, you know, put it in there. Um, a cutter, or you could use pruning shears to cut the drip line, and then you'll need staples. So all you'll do is you'll cut out the piece that had the crack in it or that was broken, and then you'll put a coupler between the area and then you'll press it together and then put a staple to make sure it holds down and then put your mulch back over it. Very simple, something you're gonna have to do pretty often if you have a drip irrigation system. And so to increase the efficiency of your irrigation system overall, you want to have uniformity. So use the same type of emitters all over. Um, clean cleanliness, so always flush the lines after repair or on a seasonal basis. Pressure, you want to manage the pressure throughout the system, so using that pressure gauge um, and then making sure your um, pressure your pressure reducer at the beginning of the system is also in full function. You want to program the controller, so update the settings at least four times a year or use your seasonal adjust to make sure that you are watering to the season. And you also want to flush um, and filter, so flush the filters. Uh, filters need to be checked a lot if you have, um, you know, a they just need to be checked a lot. I would check them on a monthly basis, honestly, uh, because that is usually the number one problem of why water does not come out the drip, um, the drip system the way it should. You also want to flush it because the filter is not perfect and some sediment are going to get into the line. 
Um, so flush the system twice a year so that, you know, you make sure the water runs clear and so you make sure the plants are getting the water as they should. Okay, so some final things I want to leave you with. Understand the water needs of your ocean-friendly garden plants, you know, low to water, um, low to moderate water use. You also want to use the needs to determine your watering goal. You should not be watering over your watering goal. It's just not necessary, especially for these kind of gardens. It actually will have a more negative effect if you're overwatering. Um, you want to program the controller, use the controller to its full capabilities, it will make your job a lot easier. Um, complete seasonal tasks and adjustments. These are not low maintenance systems. Um, these are something that you kind of have to constantly be on top of. Um, keep extra parts on hand for repairs. You're going to have to make repairs. You're going to have to um, put some drip lines together with some couplings. You're going to have to um, staple some lines now. It's just a part of it. And also mulch. Mulching is going to help reduce the damage of the drip lines. So having that thick mulch layer is very important and will help the longevity of your drip lines. Okay, so that was our irrigation system management webinar. Our next one will be on weeding and the requirements of weeding for ocean friendly gardens next Thursday at 10 a.m. Thank you for joining us today. Please email me if you have any questions or Jennifer, um, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you.